Wonderful. Well, great evening to everybody here uh, out of Vienna, actually in Bucharest and from international places. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to Dr. Jaron Brook, who will, pre who will be the main speaker, the keynote speaker at our final and last panel. And many of you who are familiar with Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand Central Romania, but also with the Ayn Rand Institute and all other institutions that um, have the same values or share the same values know, of course, Dr. Brook, who is the co-author with Ben Watkins of the national bestseller, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. Um, they, of course, have now a new book, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against uh, Income Inequality, and many, many other uh, uh, publications that Yaron has uh, published over the past years. He also ho is the host of the Yaron Brook Show, which is a live blog talk radio podcasting, airing Saturdays from 11.30 to 1 p.m., as well as the host of the Yaron Brook Show on um, AM 560 Chicago, also airing Saturdays from 2 to 3 p.m. And he's an international sword um, speaker and debate leader. Uh, as all the other speakers that you have heard before, he's also one of our partners at the Free Market Roadshow and, of course, is a frequent speaker at many other international conferences. It's hard to get him, and we are very pleasant and pleased that he's able to join us. He, of course, uh, join, uh, serves on boards um, of the Ayn Rand Institute, the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and many other international institutions, for example, the Center for Excellence in Higher Education. And he's a member of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and, of course, a member of the MPS, the Mont Pelerin Society that was founded by Hayek right after World War II in 1947 to fight to all kinds of totalitarianism. And with, uh, without further ado, I would like to hand on um, to, uh, to Yaron. Yaron, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Barbara. Um, it is uh, truly a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to uh, work with the Free Market Roadshow, and uh, they do fantastic work all over Europe and all over the world, really. And uh, and now, for the first time, I guess, with the Ayn Rand Center Romania, it's very exciting that we have an Ayn Rand Center Romania. Uh, so, uh, so congratulations, and I'm I'm really thrilled to be here. It's a, it's a pretty amazing world we live in. Uh, we live in a world in which uh, you know Barbara can be in. Uh, I think she said uh, Bucharest. Uh, Nikos earlier was in London. Uh, I guess you had technical problems, so you didn't get Deirdre McCluskey from Chicago, but you do have me from Los Angeles. And we can all engage, we can all talk, we can all, in, in real time, the picture quality is fantastic. Uh, you know, I've never used the StreamYard.com. Who knew that there was another streaming platform other than Zoom, which I've been on nonstop since the beginning of the coronavirus. But it's truly amazing the world in which we live. We can communicate across oceans without thinking about it, without really any second thought. We just click on a button on a computer and there it is, there's Bucharest, you know. And even if I had flown out and, uh, and come to your event and done it live, which would have been my preference, it would have been really nice to give Barbara a hug. It would have been really nice to, uh, to see you all in person and to interact with you live right there. Uh, that would be my preference and hopefully next year that's what we can do. But um, even then, think about what it means to get into a, a, a jet and, and fly from, from Los Angeles to Romania and, and not even think really twice about it. It's become some second nature. I mean, my point is we live in a pretty amazing world. Even in this period of COVID, which is horrible, and, and I'm sure in your various countries and, and various places where you live, it has been less or more of an issue, but here in the United States, it's been an unmitigated disaster. Even during a period like that, we're never short of groceries. The food arrives. There's a global pandemic, and yet I can order pretty much anything I want and get it within a day from Amazon and communicate with everybody in the world through Zoom and really do my work, do most of what I need to do in spite of the fact that there's a global pandemic. Imagine 
having this pandemic and the kind of government response to it, uh, which we can talk about, uh, imagine having that happen 50 years ago or even 20 years ago, before Amazon, before Zoom. So the world we live in is truly stunning. The, the, the availability of resources, the availability of, uh, you know, I often talk about and use my iPhone in my talks. There it is. There got it in front of the camera. Um, I mean, a supercomputer, entertainment system, a, 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 a superior camera, a, uh, you know, everything. I can get every piece of music ever written, any movie ever done, all this stuff just right at my fingertips on my phone. It's truly stunning. And, and I don't think we stop often enough to do two things. One is to actually appreciate how wonderful the world in which we live actually is. It it's, turns out that it's much easier for us to focus on the negatives and all the bad stuff happening. But things are, you know, there's a lot of good in the world. But more importantly, we don't stop to think about why we have this wonderful world. 250 years ago, we were all dirt poor. 250 years ago, most of us, most of us would be dead, but those who were alive, much, much smaller population on Earth, by a fact of, I think, 90, 90%, maybe 10% of the world population was alive 250 years ago, right? So a tiny population of humans, most consumed with feeding themselves, most consumed with subsistence farming or doing, you know, boring manual labor, very simplistic without any possibility of improvement. Indeed, standard of living, quality of life, life expectancy, wealth, income, barely budged for thousands of years. And then suddenly, we had this point in which income, wealth, quality of life, standard of living, life expectancy, all went through the roof. And we are still beneficiaries of that trend. Quality of life, standard of living, wealth, income, life expectancy in spite of COVID is all still going up. How did that happen? Where did that come from? What makes this amazing world we live in possible? Well, if you look around, particularly today, I think it becomes evident where all this wonderful stuff comes from. Because somebody had to create Zoom. Somebody had to imagine, build, create, modify, build, create constantly. Amazon. Every one of these companies that we benefit so much from had to have somebody use their mind to figure out solutions to problems and teach us about their particular solution to that problem. You know, somebody had to imagine an iPhone and put it into production, build it, create it, make it. So where does this come from? If we look around the world today, it comes from ability to think, to imagine, to be creative. It comes from ability to reason. And then it comes from ability to actually act on those ideas. Now, many of us, our ideas don't succeed as well as Amazon or the iPhone or anything like that. But the fact is that we might start a small business. We might do a startup. We might develop a technology that's more minor. But every one of those things contributes to the amazing life that we have today. The essential, the principle behind it is the human mind set free and our ability to act on what we come up with, on the ideas that we have. So it's freedom to use our mind and to act on our thoughts. It comes from a certain respect that we have for the individual. You know, in, in, in almost every, every place on planet Earth today, if I asked an audience, who does your life belong to? Almost everybody, almost everybody, even, even in, <laughs> surprisingly, even in China, the people in the audience would say, it belongs to me. It belongs to yourself. Your life belongs to you. But that's an innovation. That never used to be. 
250 years ago, 300 years ago, you like belong to some aristocrat, you like belong to the king, you like belong to God, you like belong to somebody else. So the idea that your life is yours, to be free to think for yourself and to act based on your thoughts, that's new. Those are the ideas that made this world around us possible. Every one of the material goods that we enjoy today are the products of our mind, are the products of their ability in spite of regulations, controls, coercion, force, enough freedom to be able to produce that product, to create it, to, to make that vision a reality. And a product of the idea that we should leave individuals free to do that. And all of these ideas, and you could, all of these ideas are really products of one era, an era that built on previous eras, but re really where it all came together, which is the Enlightenment. The European Enlightenment in the 18th century, whether in France, in, um, in, uh, in England, Scotland, and other places around Europe, this, this period of the, uh, called otherwise the age of reason or the age of science, the idea is that we have a mind and that mind is efficacious. We have reason and we can know reality by using our reason. If you think about the first thinker of the Enlightenment, I think of Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton taught us to use our mind to figure out the laws of nature and taught us that we can indeed explain the laws of nature. That truth does not reside in a book written thousands of years earlier. Truth does not reside with mystics who claim to have revelation from some mystical entity. Truth does not reside with our emotions. Truth resides with our capacity to reason, to observe reality, understand it, integrate it, induce from it, come up with, and, and then shape it by integrating our knowledge. And people, people in the Enlightenment started to look at this idea that they could understand the physical world around them without the need for a God, revelation, a Pope, somebody to tell them what to think and, and, and how the world worked. And they said to themselves, wait a minute, if we can use, if you're teaching us that we can use our reason to understand the world, and, and I can, wow, I, I get Newton, I get, I get the math, I get the physics, I can see it, it works. If I can do that, then how come I can't choose my own profession? How come, remember, Europe was still stuck in the Guild era, where you basically were what your father was? How come I can't choose the person I'm going to marry? Marriages were primarily arranged. It had nothing to do with love, but it had to do with more economics or the choice of the parents. And if I can use, the, use my mind to understand the world, why can't I choose my own political leaders? In other words, why can't I be free to think for myself? If I have this tool, reason, from which I can discover truth, then why aren't I free to discover truth? So this is really the birth of the world in which we live today. And of course, who reasons? Individuals. Not groups, not collectives, not tribes, not nations, individuals reason. And suddenly you got this growth of really two ideas that set off this revolution that we're still benefiting from today. The efficacy of reason and that your life belongs to you, that you are an individual, you think for yourself. And that in a sense, as this developed through the Enlightenment, the idea was, and your purpose in life is what? To serve, to sacrifice, to suffer, to die? No. Your purpose in life is to be happy. It's to be successful. It's to achieve your own values. And the idea 
that your moral purpose in life should be the pursuit of your own values at some level was starting to be recognized during the Enlightenment. And I think it's key to understanding the theme that we're talking about today. Because rights are really a bridge between your moral purpose in life and how to deal with other people, how to live in a social context. Because if you understand that your life, your success, your values are the purpose of your life, and then in order to achieve those values, you must use your reason. Then the question becomes, okay, but in a society, how do we how do we deal with the fact that people are pursuing the values? How do we how do we sanctify that idea that my life is mine and I can use my mind on my terms to pursue my values? And that's what the concept of individual rights does. The concept of individual rights codifies this idea. It's basically a moral principle, an ethical principle. It defines and sanctions man's freedoms of action in a social context. That's Ayn Rand's definition of a right. A right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning man's freedom of action in a social context. Because we understand that once we get in with other people, they can pose a threat to our ability to live. They can stop us from acting based on our thoughts. Indeed, they can create a situation where we can't really think or thinking becomes irrelevant. Force, coercion is the enemy of liberty. It's the enemy of freedom. And it's the enemy of reason of thinking. Think about Galileo. He's basically in house arrest because he has a theory the church does not like. You know, 50 years earlier, he would have been burnt at the stake. So he got lucky, right? Now, in house arrest, do you think Galileo is writing new theories, writing new books, writing about new discoveries that might challenge the church? No. Force Coercion, authority have limited the scope of Galileo's thinking. He's now, you know, he's not thinking about how to survive. The church, not in reality, not try to solve problems of science, but just to survive. So, authority, force, coercion, place restraints, limit our thinking. It's why, for example, if you look around the world today, the industries where we see innovation, the industries where we see progress, or the geographic locations, the, the, the countries in which we see innovation, in which we see progress, are the ones where there's least amount of coercion over man's mind. It's no accident that our airplanes, for example, get slower every year. And our cars... Automobiles, with exception of, of, of maybe Tesla, basically look exactly the same as they did. Function exactly the same as they did 30 years ago. But that our computers are a gazillion times better than they were 30 years ago. The tech industry has seen very little regulations, controlled coercion, force. The automobile and airplane industry see a lot. There's a reason why you see very little innovation in healthcare in Europe. Because Europe is super controlled. There's coercion, there's authority, there's a church. Call it the NHS if you live in England. The Church of Socialized Medicine. Of government bureaucrats who say what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. So there's little innovation. Whereas America has a little bit of freedom in healthcare. Not a lot, a little bit. And that's why... Of about 60% of all innovations of healthcare, certainly in drugs, but also in, in, um, in devices, happen in the United States. Because there's a little bit of freedom. So to innovate, to produce, to create, to build, to make, man's mind must be free. Free of coercion force. And that's what individual rights identifies. It says... That you have 
the concept of rights says that you have the freedom to take all the actions required by your nature, the nature of a rational being, to support, to further, to fulfill, and to enjoy your life. The only responsibility, if you will, you have towards your neighbors in this context is not to violate their rights. It's to acknowledge that they have the same rights as you do. That if they can't coerce you, if they can't stop you, because freedom is freedom from coercion, from force, the freedom to live as a positive. Your life based on your values, based on the use of your mind. Then your neighbors, the only obligation they have towards you is not to violate your rights, not to interfere with your freedom. So rights are freedoms of action. The freedom to act in support of your life. Rights are more sanctioned on a positive. We talk about negative rights and positive rights, which I think is confuses the issue. Rights are more sanctioned of a positive. The freedom that every individual has to use his mind in pursuit of his goals based on his uncoerced voluntary choices. So rights are crucial, and it's no accident that the pinnacle, if you will, of the Enlightenment is the founding of the United States of America, at least politically the pinnacle of the Enlightenment. You could argue scientifically it's something else, but from a political perspective, the founding of America is the manifestation of the Enlightenment thinking in politics. And in particular, the Declaration of Independence of the United States is a manifestation of these Enlightenment ideas. It is the recognition that all men are equal, not equal in outcome, not equal in opportunity, but equal in rights. All men are born free. You don't get any special privileges because of your status. Remember, Europe at the time, if you were aristocrat, you had status. You had special privileges. In those days, there was really such a thing as privilege. Uh, that concept today is misused and abused. And you have a right, right to your life according to the Declaration of Independence. And right to them meant this freedom of action, the action to pursue your values on your terms, using your mind. You have a right to liberty, which is the right to think, think for yourself. Not have to bow to the authority of anyone. Which includes, for example, the right to free speech, the right to express your thoughts. You have a right to property, Unfortunately, they crossed that out of the declaration. It would have been a big help to our cause if they'd kept it. Um, in other words, you have a right to the fruits of your labor. You have a right to the fruits of your thinking, the fruits of your work. And in a recognition of the source of these rights, in a sense, the moral source of these rights, you have a right to pursue your happiness. The standard for everything is your life as an individual. And this set off, this idea, manifest in the Declaration of Independence, but then manifest throughout Europe in political changes, set off the last 250 years of progress, innovation, creation, building, making, and led to the amazing life that in spite of all the hardships and in spite of all the problems, in spite of, in spite of our horrific, disastrous politicians, we still enjoy. It's the fruits of those ideas. It's the fruits of this recognition of these rights. And there is, in this sense, Nico said it earlier, but there is, in this sense, only one right. And this relates to this idea that the, in Europe you have, uh, what, 286 rights or 352? I, I can't keep track. It, you know, and, and everything is a right. You only have one right. That right is to your life. It's a right, as I said, to live on your terms. It's a right to use your mind and to act on the basis of your judgment. All other rights, all other legitimate rights, and 
are derived from this one way and must be proved in the context of this one way. A right cannot place an obligation on other people, cannot place a duty on anybody, including yourself. The only obligation, in a sense, I don't think it's an obligation because it's a negative obligation, is not to interfere with others. But it's not a duty or an obligation. It's just a negative. Abstain from violating rights because you have them. Every individual has them. And of course, so you cannot have a right to other people's time. You cannot have a right to other people's labor. You cannot have a right to anything that somebody else produces or creates or makes. If you want it, there's only one way to deal with other people. And that is as a trader. That is in the context of win-win relationships. That is in the context of, I want what you produce, I'll pay for it with what I produce. So the only moral way in which individuals should interact with one another is through this trader principle of win-win relationships. So to end, because I'm supposed to talk for about half an hour, um, and then we'll take questions. If we want to preserve the life that we have, and if we want to make it even better, because in spite of what I said about how wonderful life is today, it like could be so much better. We could be so much richer. We could be so much happier. There would be could be so many more material and spiritual values for us to enjoy. In many respects, as compared to the parallel universe in which uh, in which people take individual rights seriously. We are dirt poor. If we want that kind of world, a world of freedom, a world where we don't shut down our lives because of a virus, a world in which we can see an endless progression of progress in every aspect of our lives, not just in those that the authorities deem not to regulate right now, and that's, I think, going to be changing. If we truly want to see the full flourishing of the human potential, the full flourishing of our own individual lives, then at least in politics, the one idea we must fight for, the one concept we must not let go of, is individual rights. If you care about your own happiness, then you care about the freedom to pursue that happiness. Then you have to care about your rights, and we should all embrace kind of the, the, the battle, the fight for individual rights and against those that would destroy our lives by destroying this concept. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Yaram. This was a real tour de raison, uh, starting out with the European Enlightenment and ending up with uh, the lockdown crisis, obviously after the COVID pandemic. Um, I have a couple of questions right away from the floor, and I would uh, suggest we start with the questions before I have uh, okay. some more challenging points uh, that I would like to ask you. So the first one is by Hugh Ac um, Axton, and he says, if it takes centuries for freedom to become popular and the cultural norm, then is there a way to accelerate the process? We'll probably all be dead until it happens. How about ideas such as to succeed uh, or other rational people and create free states or a political revolution like 1765, etc.? So yes, it takes a long time. People have to appreciate freedom. Uh, people have to embrace freedom. People have to learn its values. And indeed, we're moving away from the Enlightenment. So it's not that we, if freedom is increasing, particularly in the West, it's not increasing. Maybe it's increasing in, in parts of Asia and parts of Africa. And even there, I once thought that freedom was increasing in China. And I think the last four years or so, we have seen a, a complete reversal of whatever uh, uh, political gains people had made in, in speech and in other things in China. So China's heading in the wrong direction. But certainly the West has been heading in the wrong direction for 100 years. Uh, America was freer in the beginning of the 20th century than it is today. 
at least in, in certain respects. In other respects, to be fair, where well, we are freer today. You know, certainly if you were gay 100 years ago, uh, America is much freer today. If you're a woman 100 years ago, it, you know, in many respects, it's freer today. Um, it takes a long time for people to understand these concepts because our, the philosophers who dominate the world today and have dominated the world for the last 200 years are anti-enlightenment. They reject the ideas of enlightenment. From Immanuel Kant on, philosophy has been an anti-enlightenment philosophy. I mean, uh, 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 German romantics did not think individual rights meant anything. Indeed, they advocated for collectivism, which is the antithesis of individualism. And uh, and if you if you look at if you look at of course uh, somebody like Karl Marx, you see that in its full flourishing, the collectivism. Uh, modern philosophers don't believe in anything. You know, postmodernism doesn't hold anything to be true. Remember, in, in the Declaration of Independence, they said we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I don't think they were self-evident, but they were true. But today, there's no such thing as true. So it's it's very difficult today to reverse the course of history because that's what we're doing. We, 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 we've got this momentum from the Enlightenment, but there are no Enlightenment thinkers. There's no people defending the Enlightenment except a few of us, and we have to try to reverse it, and that's very difficult. So, yes, it's going to take a long time, and yes, I will not see it in my lifetime. I hope some of the younger people here see it in their lifetime, but it's a long, and it's going to be arduous, and it's going to be a fight uh, to, to be about freedom. So, so just to address this idea of secession or... Look, you can fantasize, you can play mind games, you can pretend, but it, there's no realistic outcome where that is possible. Who's going to secede? Texas? Texas, where you, you, you don't have certain rights because they're so freaking religious? Uh, how long would it take the United States military to overthrow a secession from Texas? You think the statists and the collectivists and the rest of the world are going to let you secede? You start an island. There is no free land anywhere. All land is occupied by somebody. All land is has a flag in it. You think other countries that have militaries and weapons are going to let you do it? Uh, you think the United States will let you start a free country where uh, you have free banking? They're going to be after you from moment one as soon as they, they're going to declare you money laundering and drug smuggling and all this stuff. There is no way for you to escape the collectivism and statism of the world as it is today. The only option we have is to stay and fight. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not as promising as you probably wanted to hear it, but uh, we have to be, stay realistic. Yeah. Um, Robert uh, Bratescu has the next question, and he says, what would you tell public intellectuals from Romania who call for hard lockdowns even to this day and justify them by saying that lives are more important than the economy and profits? I've seen, uh, he says that he has seen this argument from a public uh, figure, sure. medic. And sure. so what do you think? I mean, we have heard this argument all over Europe and it's not only in Romania. Not just in Europe, believe me, in America, it's all over the place. Yeah. What is life without the ability to work? What is life without the ability to profit? This separation of lives from economy is bogus. There is no life without economy. Right. And, and, and they even know it because they have to keep essential workers. So they, they realize that somebody has to work for you to stay alive. But what if I want to work so I can stay alive? Who are they to tell me what my life is? What important is my life? This is about individual freedom, individual values. Now, you might decide that your health, because you're old or because you have pre-existing conditions or whatever, you're going to stay locked up at home because you can't afford to get coronavirus. That's fine. Everybody has the right absolutely to do that. But you don't have a right to tell me how to live my life. And what I view is more important. I know, I even know old people, 80 something years old, who got this COVID, they would die. Without question, they've got heart problems or lung problems or whatever. And they're saying, look, I probably got two, three years to live anyway. I'd rather see my grandkids. I'd rather go out. I'd rather hang out with friends. And if I have to die, if I die now, then I die now. But I'm not going to stay in lockup for two years. That's insane. That What's the point of living? And, and this is the thing. The only person who can say what the point of living is and what life constitutes for you is you. So 
if you're young or if you've decided you're not worried about COVID, the only thing I think, the only obligation you have is not to be reckless with other people's lives. So, you know, you have to respect the fact that other people could get it from you. So I'm a big fan of socially distancing. I have no problem. I'm a big fan of wearing masks in the right situation, in the right context. If you're indoors with a bunch of people uh, that you don't know and, and you, you know, you might be carrying and you might. I'm also a huge fan of testing. So if we could get tests where you could test yourself every day or every time you were going to go out and hang out with friends, that would be ideal. And if you test positive, you stay home. And if you test negative, you go out. And it's easy. And everybody does that. So there are ways around this without somebody else imposing their values on you and using coercion in order to enforce those values. Well, thank you. I have another question from Alice, obviously, Rom Romania. Romania. Um, Yaron, do patents and copyrights use coercion to gain monopoly privileges? In against intellectual monopoly, also Kinsella, he argues that these are not necessary for innovation. Ideas are, are not scarce resources, so they cannot be owned. We own our body and our property, as you said. So we are free to think, as you said. How about ideas not being the same as the concept for ownership? And of course, it says, I know Barbara won't agree, but <laughs> we will have a, de a debate separately. <laughs> won't agree with whom? With Kinsella or with me? Yeah. <laughs> well, <that>? we'll see. <laughs> I'm going to be radical here. All property, fundamentally, at root, is intellectual property. The thing that makes the land property is what you do with it. Well, how do you do that? How do you do something with the land? How do you know how to cultivate the land? How do you know how to build a building on the land? How do you know how to make that land yours? By using your mind. It's ideas. Ideas of how to do agriculture. So it's not just physical labor. Nothing human beings do is just physical labor. It all has at its root an intellectual process. And indeed, the more you use your ideas on the land, the more valuable the land will become. The more you innovate, the more you do stuff, the more, and, and we recognize it. So I am absolutely 100% pro intellectual property. And look, I could be pro intellectual property from a utilitarian perspective. There's absolutely no question that intellectual property uh, uh, supports innovation. Kinsella is wrong. And uh, if you want to read, Alternative views on this, uh, look up Adam Mossoff, M-O-S-O-F-F, -F -F, a law professor at George Mason University, who is, I think, the, the, the strongest proponent of intellectual property uh, right now, in probably in the world, and has debated people like Kinsella, and, you know, and maybe has debated Kinsella himself on this issue. So uh, from a purely practical perspective, yes, it's absolutely necessary. But from a, look, if I write a book, I've written a book, Equal is Unfair. I wrote the book. Now, the ideas that I express in the book, you can use. Nobody's preventing you from using my ideas. So I don't have intellectual property on the ideas. But you don't get to take my book, which is the physical manifestation of those ideas, and photocopy it and distribute it or put your name on it. You don't get to do that because they're my ideas and it's my physical manifestation of those ideas. If I invent a motor, a new motor, right? If you can figure out the ideas behind the motor and, and use them in some other application, fine. But you can't copy my motor. My motor is the physical manifestation of the ideas. And it's the physical manifestation is protected by intellectual property, right? Not the idea in and of itself. So philosophical ideas are not copyrighted. They're not, but Atlas Shrugged, or Ayn Rand's The Virtue of Selfishness is copyrighted. And it's Ayn Rand's property, just like if she owned a home or if she owned a piece of land. So I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of intellectual property rights. Look, there are a lot of complications here. There's a lot of technicalities for how long, uh, how exactly should the laws, what should be protected exactly. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but the principle, I think, is unequivocal. And Ayn Rand wrote an essay on copyrights and the patents 
in uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, there was an essay there on this issue by Ayn Rand. So if you're interested in a deeper look, look up Adam Asa, but also look up Ayn Rand's essay uh, in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And after all, the protection of property rights is just nothing else but the roots of capitalism and allows capitalism to flourish Absolutely. and work. Absolutely. Put it in a nutshell. So the next, the next question, I think we have time for those last two questions here. One is by Fun Jr. And he writes, in your book on inequality, you talk about freedom and that inequality is not a problem. He agrees. So what is the relationship between private property and inequality? Yaron. Well, if inequality is what a problem, then, uh, yeah, I mean, the relationship is that people who have more have more because they produce more, typically. And that the, the more that they produced is their private property. And that they nobody has a right to that. Nobody can just take it in the name of inequality. I'm going to take Bob's stuff and give it to somebody else because they have less. There's no right to do that. So the idea of property rights, the idea of private property is stuff I produced is mine. And if I produced a lot, then it's none of anybody's business. If I produced a lot, medium amount, a little bit, it's mine. And nobody has a right to take it from me. Nobody has a right to redistribute it. And I don't have a right to anybody else, anything else that somebody else produced. So the two are related in the sense that the only way to get inequality is to produce different amounts. And we all do produce different amounts. And we own what we produce. And that's where private property comes in. I think that's what you're asking. I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what the question was. <laughs> well, thank you very Hopefully much. Answer meant something. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you made it very clear that you know the more fruit, uh, the more uh, you work, the harder you work, the more you accomplish, uh, the more opportunity, of course, you have. And the last question here, we have the review of social and economic issues. So they would tell you that uh, that you can infect someone if you don't stay at home. How do you how do you respond? I think that's absolutely right. Of course, you can infect somebody if you don't stay at home. So first, I'd respond by encouraging uh, rapid tests that we can test at home, so we can we can know if we go outside if we've got the virus or not. But I, you know, second, I would say that the people who don't want to be infected should stay home. Um, there is a risk to being in public. There's a risk to being with other people, not just from COVID, but from other diseases and other things, and that. I encourage people when they interact with other people to wear masks and to act responsibly and to keep socially distancing. You shouldn't be hugging, kissing, and shaking hands with people right now. It's probably not a good idea. It's probably not a good idea to do it during flu season either. Maybe maybe we'll we'll develop habits that are more healthier for us. The, the, the Asians have been wearing masks during flu season every year, not just during COVID. So maybe that's not a bad idea. But if you don't want to get the infection, then, then stay home, protect yourself. And I will do what I can not to infect you, but I'm not going to stop living in order to not infect you. Uh, if you come to a restaurant and I'm in the restaurant, I'm going to assume you know the risk, you've taken on the risk, and you are willing to suffer the consequences of that risk. Each one of us is. That's why we're in the restaurant. If you don't want to take the risk, don't go to the restaurant. If you don't want to, you know, so, so each one of us as individuals should make choices about the risk. And we should try to minimize um, unintended interactions with other people where it's not chosen, right? So where, where we interact with other people without them being able to assess this risk stuff. But if you go to a restaurant, if you go to see a theater, if you go to the movie theater, then you know what you're doing. Then you're taking on a risk. It's not my responsibility to live your life for you and make the, the risk assessment for you. Uh, but look, I, I have a friend who's 87 years old. Before I go see him, every single time, I get a test. I get a rapid test so that I know, because I know that if he gets it, he's going to die. So I take the personal responsibility of testing myself to make sure that I'm not infecting him. But if I go to a restaurant, I'm assuming that other people in the restaurant know what they're doing. They're either young and healthy or they don't care or whatever, but it's their responsibility, not mine. Well, thank you, Yaron. We 
uh, took full circle coming back to responsibility, self-responsibility. It's been a pleasure to have had you and we are looking forward to next year's Free Market Roadshow and many other events that we have uh, been together, co-hosted, debated all our issues on freedom and how we can live a, a, a prosperous, better life because of uh, all those values that we share. Yaron, thank you very much. Best regards to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, stay safe and healthy. And Thank looking forward uh, to the next event. And I will go back to Mirella and also to Nikos, who will do the final uh, summaries. And I will also say bye bye with them together with you. Thank you very much, Yaron. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mirella and Nikos and everybody else for organizing this. Uh, and good luck to the Einman Center Romania. And of course, I look forward to seeing you on the road somewhere, Barbara. For sure. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye.